Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. Now that we have completed our study in Ezekiel 33, we are going to recap the study that we did, I believe roughly about 25 weeks ago, on Zechariah 5, and then segue from there into the balance of the book of Zechariah. So before we do this, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his blessing as we open his word on this Sabbath day. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these hours of the Sabbath. <clears throat> we thank you for this time where we may rest and reflect upon the work <clears throat> that was done in this prior week, that we may set aside our cares and our labors, come before you to understand, to learn, to be directed, so that we might more clearly be ready to give a message that you would have given to this world. Please forgive us of our sins. Please direct us in the path that you would have us to walk. May your will be done. Please be with Theodore as he seeks time to consider the things that are occurring. Be with those that are not with us at this time and with those that may view this later. Help us now. Direct us. We ask we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now, Zechariah 5. We have two sections in this particular book. We begin with the portion that by the flying roll is showed the case of thieves and of false swearers. And then starting in verse 5, by a woman in an ephah, pressed under a weight and carried away to Shinar, is denoted wickedness and the judgment of it. Now, this first portion that <clears throat> we found that was contributed from Sister White, Manuscript 175 of 1897. Elder Haskell walked over to our place and took breakfast with us, and we had quite a profitable interview. He requested that we go upon the school grounds and select the place where the building shall be for the church. We spent some hours in this work. It was not an easy task to decide the most favorable position but we decided to take more than one lot. We must have three or four and maybe five. We'll, work will commence on Sunday morning, August 22nd, 1897. So she is writing here 127 years ago. This is a great enterprise for this part of the country. Our school being established here demands that we arise and build. We cannot present to the Lord any meager offering. We want, when this work is done, to have done our best according to the light that God has given. We want to hear from the Lord the word of approval, as did the remnant who obeyed the voice of the Lord, their God, coming to them through Haggai the prophet, when they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts. Haggai 1.14 The word of approval came, I am with you, saith the Lord. Haggai 2.4 Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Zechariah 1.16. Chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5 are chapters appropriate for our study. We are to learn our lessons from these chapters, for history will be and is being repeated. So, what does she state here that history will be and is being repeated in these words that were written 127 years ago? What can we take from this? Uh, what well, the words of the prophets are for all time. All right. But is she not saying here that the admonitions in these chapters of Zechariah were being repeated when she wrote this in 1897. I mean, she says it is being repeated. And is she yes, not? So much. <clears throat> Sorry, Dwight. she really stresses that we need to hear from the Lord or we want to hear from the Lord the word of approval, as did the remnant who obeyed the voice of the Lord, that God, their God coming to them through Haggai the prophet. Well, if she's our prophetess right we should be heeding her words we should be more keen keen on uh, on 
scrutinizing the word and word and absorbing it and applying it. So here uh, she yes I'm sir. Sorry. Wouldn't it wouldn't she be saying that that history's gonna be repeated in our time? I'm agreeing. Yes. I'm saying that, that, that is very that is very, very possible, if not definite. But in this in this section, when we are looking at this in Zechariah chapter five, here she is combining Zechariah and Haggai. Now from other items that we have studied, why would she be combining these two books? Why would she take the admonition shown in these books and present it concurrently? Well, partly because those those two two, two prophets were a team, right? I mean, they both preached around the same time. Okay, exactly. They both preached around the same time. Now, for those that have chosen to make use of the study that Brother Stephen had done, tabled history, we can identify that these two prophets were giving a message during the second year of Darius. Now, was there anything important that was happening in Jerusalem in that second year of Darius? Does anyone recall? Okay. In the second year of Darius, the work on the temple began again. Can the people worship without their temple? Can they assemble to worship without the temple? Well, they need a place, place to meet, but I mean, sometimes you could meet in small groups privately. Okay, but if this history will be repeated, and if this history was repeated, how will this history be repeated in our time? Will there need to be a literal temple in Jerusalem? No, of course not. How will the temple be constructed? Of oh, souls that, that are consecrated to Christ. How does Peter put it? Aren't we living stones? Thank you. So, <laughs> okay. So at this point, second year of Darius, the work on the temple begins again. Zechariah 5.1, then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold, a flying roll. Here, reference of the translators was back to Ezekiel 2.9. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me and lo, a roll of a book was therein. Zechariah 5.2, and he said unto me, what seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof is 10 cubits. When God sends a message to any person, minister or doctor, if men pursue a course to make of no effect of the message sent, a course that destroys the influence of that message that God designed should make a change in the principles of the one corrected and turn his heart to repentance. It would be better for these men if they had never been born. Wickedness and deceit remain in the one to whom the Lord in mercy sent his message. But they, through Satan's devising, took it upon themselves to justify and vindicate the one whom God had corrected. And he took it upon himself to refuse the message given and went on, sustained by the men who claimed to be the ministers and the doctors of the Lord. The one who should have realized his sin and corrected his evil was presumptuous and turned from the messages of God to follow his own course until sin in deception, in falsehood, in unprincipled working, in underhand dealing became current. Whether there is any hope of a change, we know not. But every soul who has built that man up in his crooked course of action, which they know was not justice and righteousness, will suffer with the transgressor unless they shall humble themselves before God and show that repentance that needeth not to be repented of. Thus saith the Lord, I am the high and holy one who inhabiteth eternity. The Lord God will be vindicated in the interest 
he has taken to bring men to repentance, that they should see their crooked ways and turn and be converted. But ministers and doctors have stepped in between God and men, reproved and have made of no effect reproofs he has sent, notwithstanding that the warning was to save erring men and turn them from their wrong course of action, that their usefulness should not be destroyed, that they should repent and be converted, and their sins, which are now registered in the books of heaven, should be blotted out. Okay? The spirit who asked Zechariah, what seest thou? To which he answered, I see a flying roll, also caused an angel to fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwelleth on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him. In parentheses, let no glory be given to erring sinful men. For the hour of his judgment is come. Who is the spirit that sent this angel flying in the midst of heaven? Who is the spirit that is speaking to Zechariah? It's God's spirit. Would it also be Christ? Is that possible? The word does speak of the spirit of Christ prophesying and so forth. Okay. Many indeed will not understand, but will stumble at the words contained in the roll. How many will there be that will stumble at the warning of Revelation 14? How many are there today that understand that there is a flying roll that is understanding an urgent message is being given, but yet they do not wish to accept the message then he said unto me this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth for everyone that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it and everyone that sweareth shall be cut off on that side according to it in other words these that are stealing are holding themselves guiltless those that are swearing that we will keep the word of the lord and not do it are just as bad as those that are stealing. Do we wish to be under the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth? Now, this curse is identified in the book of Malachi. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. We've already seen the effect of the curse on the earth back in the book of Genesis. We've already seen what happens when men do not keep to the statutes and the commandments of God, because then the earth, which had its Sabbath taken away from him by man, was allowed its Sabbaths, and yet we have many within the nation of Israel that went away and never returned. And I will bring it forth, saying, the Lord of hosts. And it shall enter into the house of a thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. What happens to a house when the stones and the timbers are consumed? Isn't that house destroyed? Zechariah writes, then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked. And behold, a flying roll. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof is 10 cubits. And said he unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off on this side according to it, and every one that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side according to it i shall bring it forth saith the lord and it shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name and it shall remain in the midst of his house 
and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. So now, how large is 20 cubits by 10 cubits? About 30 by 15 foot. Well, if we're using what we understand for cubits right now, we would take 20 by 10. And then if we were going to convert that to inches, would we not have that as 3,600 inches? Is it 18 inches per cubit? I'm not sure what you're using. Well, there's 18 inches by, per cubit. There's also 21 if we're going to look at this as, as a royal cubit. Which one are you thinking then? 18 or 21 or well, both? I'm, I'm looking at either. Does this have anything, any, any important symbolism for us right now? The great roll, 20 cubits in length and 10 cubits in breadth, was the measurement of the porch of Solomon's temple. In this roll is written the name of the wrongdoer unless he repents of his wrong. The Lord's eye is upon every transaction, and his judgment will come upon those who do wrong. The ninth chapter of Ezekiel should be studied in connection with Ezekiel 2, 1 to 10, and the fifth chapter of Revelation. Here's an interesting thing about, uh, yes, about the timbers and burning and so on. Okay. Interesting thing is fire insurance costs less for a wood structure than a metal structure. People, really? People, yeah. Yeah. Reason being is that the wood wood uh, has to burn from the outside and burn through for it to fail. Um, okay. and, and with metal, you heat metal up and it and it twists and fails. So it falls quicker. So when I'm thinking about this, the timbers of the sanctuary or whatever that is supposed to be burning there, it's going to burn for a little while. It's going to be painful. It's going to take a little while to really burn to the ground. It's just an interesting thing about it. How does that work? How does that work though with a, a structure that's made of stone? Stone wouldn't burn. Yeah, the, uh, what's that thing with the, uh, temple, Solomon's temple when the Romans burnt it was it right uh, that the gold melted into the cracks of the stones and that's why the the stones were taken off one from another to recover the gold that had melted in between the cracks wow. that's the what i've heard okay that one stone shall not be left upon another and that's how that prophecy was fulfilled all right interesting point Thank you. From Manuscript 20 of 1899, beginning in paragraph 7, the parable of the talents represents a most important truth, which all should understand. God has not distributed his talents capriciously. To every man are given abilities which will fit him for the work God calls him to do. There is to be no sleeping at the post of duty. Every soul is to understand that he has work to do for God. Study carefully the fourth chapter of Zechariah and learn what the two olive trees there referred to mean. Read it carefully, verse by verse, for in this chapter, the features of the work in which we are engaged are plainly set forth. Here again. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man is wakened out of his sleep. And he said unto me, what seest thou? And I said, I have looked. And behold, a candlestick all of gold and a bowl on the top of it, and his seven lamps thereof, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and one upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Zechariah 4, verses 1 to 6. Our power and efficiency are not in ourselves. 
we receive them from a higher source. Then I then answered I and said unto him, what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, what be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipe empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord. Then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Verses 11 to 14. Now we return. And we find again, Zechariah is given the vision of the flying roll. The events that are taking place on earth are critically watched in heaven. For by them, human beings are being tested and proved. Every individual soul, if he would receive the seal of the living God, must hear the word of the Lord and do it with exactitude. There must be no such thing as haphazard religion if men would have a place in the family of God. All who are brought into connection with God will be pure and holy. They will receive the holy oil from the heavenly messengers and will impart it to their fellow men. Now, what does it mean that we are to do the will of the Lord, to hear the word of the Lord, and to do it with exactitude. What does what does that say to you? Now, a comment that was placed in the chat said that the temple had the evildoers' names inscribed in it in the porch. The heavenly Jerusalem has the 144,000's names in the gates. Revelation 21.12. Now, where do we find that this that the evildoers' names were inscribed in the porch. I thought we just read that. It's in the roll, isn't it? Oh, it's in the roll. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's in the roll. My ADHD is showing. <laughs> okay. Okay. The talents entrusted to men are not to be employed to please and to glorify self, but to honor him from whom those talents come. And as these gifts of God are appreciated and valued and used, they will increase. The fullness of Christ awaits every receiver. Of our own selves, we are poor. But if we come to Christ and we ask him in faith, we shall receive eternal riches. Christ stands waiting for us to ask him for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Think about that for just a moment. Christ stands waiting for us to ask him for the gift of the Holy Spirit. She's writing this in 1899. She is writing this 125 years ago. I may say you will receive, but my word is not enough. You must take the words of Christ and understand his willingness to bless and strengthen and give to you the fullness of his riches. The more precious the treasures of grace are discovered and drawn upon, the more anxious we will be for all to enjoy these heavenly riches. According to our capacity for understanding and appreciating these great gifts of God will be our ability to communicate, to enlighten the minds of those who are in the darkness of error. We are to draw from the inexhaustible resource and gladden hungry, starving souls by presenting to them the living bread which comes down from heaven. Every man should consider himself of value with God because he has been entrusted with the richest gift that can be obtained. The soul is thrilled with the love of Christ as it drinks deep from the inexhaustible fountain. This is the will of God concerning you, even your sanctification. Although our sins may be as a mountain before us, if we humble our hearts and confess our sins, trusting in the merits of a crucified and risen Savior, he will forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As the soul yearns after God, he will find more and still more of the unsearchable riches of his grace. I like to note that it's the living bread that comes down from heaven that, that we're to give to right. others. 
that living bread is a living witness, not necessarily knowledge, but it would be a knowledge of Christ as seen in the light. It's a living witness that attracts man to Christ. Knowledge lived out. Okay. The salvation of one soul reveals the depths of a Savior's matchless love. If all church members who have known the truth would accept this salvation, they would bear the testimony. We have redemption through his blood. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law of sin and death. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us and gave himself for us. Believing in him, we rejoice with joy, unspeakable and full of glory. Here we are told to see Ephesians 1 verse 7, Romans 8, 2 through 4, and verse 37, Titus 2:14, 1 Peter 1 8. Now we come to manuscript 64 of 1902. I dare not leave Cleveland without presenting this message to those who have engaged in the strange work of hindering the Lord's service, right? Men have had it in their power greatly to help the work in the South by being men of principle, honest with their brethren and with God. What a difference showing there would, there would today be in the Southern field had they fulfilled God's purpose for them. The neglect of this field stands as a witness against them. Here's Mrs. White. I dare not leave Nashville. This is one of the statements that we were looking at prior to July 18th of 2020. She could not think of leaving Nashville without presenting this message to those who have engaged in the strange work of hindering the Lord's servants. There have been many that before July 18th chose to try to stop the warning message of going out. Was this a message strictly from Future for America? Spirit of prophecy. This is a question I ask people who uh, they say things like, should be repented of, apologize to Nashville, apologize to the world, apologize to the church for embarrassing it, and repent of it. Um, so I, I just simply ask them, well, when will you give that warning to Nashville? Or will you? Okay. And their answers? Haven't heard one yet. Okay. Now this portion jumps forward a little bit. In the same document, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts saying, execute true judgment. And show mercy and compassion every man to his brother. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against your, his brother in your heart. But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law. And the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it came to pass that as he cried, and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among the nations from whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them, that no man passed through, nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. Who was responsible for laying the pleasant land desolate? Those who refused to hear and obey God's word. Okay. Are we among that number today? Well, God help us. I think I know sometimes I, I refuse and don't obey his word. I know only too well from what you speak, for I find myself in that at times. We cannot afford to lay the pleasant land desolate. The following paragraph returns us to Zechariah 5, verses 1 to 4. So it's interesting that the land was desolate after them, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. 
Zechariah is again repeated here by Mrs. White, stating that I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. We've just identified that this flying roll was 20 cubits by 10 cubits. We've identified that this flying roll was the size of the porch of Solomon's temple. And we know that this roll, this book, has the names of those that have refused to do the word of the Lord. Is that where we want our names written? From the book of education, she again repeats, Zechariah 5, 1 to 4. Against every evildoer, God's law utters condemnation. He may disregard that voice. He may seek to drown its warning, but in vain. It follows him. It makes itself heard. It destroys his peace. If unheeded, it pursues him to the grave. It bears witness against him at the judgment. A quenchless fire, it consumes at last the soul and the body. What is it that consumes the soul and the body? I mean, this is as much an open book test as we could have. What is it? It says God's law. Exactly. So it is by the law that we are condemned. It is by the law that we are consumed. It is by the law that we are destroyed. Man can choose to try to disregard the voice of God. Man can choose to seek to drown out its warnings. But is that going to happen? No, not at all. Well, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I'm, I'm noting uh, it's that voice. And he may disregard that voice. And it's the voice of the law of God, our conscience. Okay. That's our, so it's as we disregard the voice of our conscience, which is comes from the law, that when we disregard it, when I disregard it, it hardens my heart. It, it takes away my peace. I have no peace. And, and it pursues me even to the grave. If, if, because God will strive with us until there is no hope, which is when there is no breath. So, yeah. It's, yeah. That voice of our conscience, trying to drown it with the pleasures of life or whatever. Uh, yeah, God loves us so much that he doesn't leave us to be in in peace in, in, our, in our sin. So it's really an act of love trying to save us. Right. Yeah. Letter 123, 1904. Again, she quotes Zechariah 5, 1 to 4. Again, the same passages are being covered. But here, she makes the statement, every evil worker will receive at God's hand according to his works. I want your ambition to be a sanctified ambition. So that the angels of God can inspire your heart with holy zeal, leading you to move forward steadily and solidly and making you a bright and shining light. Your perceptive faculties will increase in power and soundness if your whole being, body, soul, and spirit is consecrated to the accomplishment of a holy work. Make every effort in and through the grace of Christ to attain to the high standards set before you. You can be perfect in your sphere as God is perfect in his sphere. Has not Christ declared, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect? You are not to regard yourself as merely a passive recipient of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has entrusted to you precious talents, and he requires the improvement of of those talents. Interest from the principal lent 
is his due. Interest upon this that he is providing is God's portion. You are to be a worker together with him, submitting your will to his will. You will improve in speech and in spiritual conceptions. You will be enabled to give the people, through your prayerful efforts, that which God has given to you. Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up thou na- thine eyes and see what is this that goeth forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, Moreover, this is their resemblance to all the earth. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of an ephah. So, this is a talent of lead, and this talent of lead is being compared to a woman. Why? And he said, this is wickedness. And he cast it into the middle of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and heaven. Then I said to the angel that talked to me, Whither do these bear the ephah? And he said unto me, To build it an house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set, therefore, upon her own base. Here, we would give reference back to Jeremiah 29, 5, Jeremiah 29, 28, and Genesis 10, verse 10. Build ye houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. For therefore he sent us in Babylon, saying, This captivity is long. Build ye houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. What happened to those that chose to build their house in the Babylonian area, and that then heard the warning to return, and chose to return not? Are we today building our house in Shinar, or are we building our house upon the word of God. What are we doing? What is our choice today? All right, brothers and sisters, here's where we're at. We've now gone back over Zechariah chapter five. Here again, we're given many symbols. We're given many items for us to consider. This next week, we're going to be going over Zechariah chapter six. Do we have any other comments, questions, or observations of what we have covered that we need to address again. For uh, Zechariah 5, 9, says, does the, the, the uh, two, two women? I was thinking there was a papal church in the apostate Protestants. And a stork is an unclean bird. Right. But this ephah, this basket with the talent of lead, this talent of lead is being compared as stated as being a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. Now, lead is great if you're looking for something to be heavy. Years ago in plumbing, lead used to be used. You used to have lead pipes, right? Yep. Poisoning the people. Okay. So you had lead pipes, then you had galvanized iron, then you had copper, now you have plastic. Isn't it an, an interesting progression for water to be provided in this way? Copper is still used in medical applications. Just a note, especially in medical gaps. Okay. But yeah, where are you going with that? Well, here is lead. As you just pointed out, lead, when used to carry water, was poisoning the people. Yeah, lead is lead is still used, but in drainage applications, and not a lot of it because it's easily malleable. 
Right. Or drain. But yeah, not in water supply. All right. But it's used for what you would call um, uh, uh, you can waste, waste you water. Stay? I'm sorry, um, Kelly. Can you restate um, that? Uh, uh, copper is still used in medical gas in hospitals. And it's uh, used in some of the water supplies as well. But uh, plastic is used in hospitals, but copper is used for medical gas. And, and lead is still used in drainage applications because to, for a drain, sometimes it can be odd shaped. So it's easily malleable. It's softer than, than any other metal and it doesn't rust. So that's one reason, but it's used in dirty water or waste water, not for water supply to drinking. Is that, is that what you were thinking? You, you do the waste water. The waste water yeah. is returned back into the creek, right? Yes. But when it is used, it does have to go through filtration system. Like take, for instance, you're sitting in the dentist chair and you spit out into the dentist chair uh, lead amalgam, which they still use some. Um, it's also in an inert state, but anyway, we won't go into that, that part of it. Um, <clears throat> the the waste sinks in a dentist's office are very, very expensive because they have to go through uh, expensive an expensive filtration system. So they are careful about turning it out to the to the streams and such where it finally does end up back. And also the drainage systems for sewage are a separate drainage system from say water that runs off of the road. Water that runs off the road is a storm sewer system. Water that comes from waste and is, goes to a treatment plant first. And you could, I wouldn't, but you can pretty much, much drink that water once it comes out of the sewage treatment plant, if it's done properly. In application, we could think of how from our mind from being polluted with the things of this world, going through the filter of the Holy Spirit, it can come out clean. If without that filter, it spews forth death. Okay. So, any other thoughts or comments at this time? Thank you, by the way, for, for what you contributed there, brothers. Shall we then close this study with prayer? Gracious, loving Father, Help us now that our names may not be written in this role. Help us, Father, to follow and willingly to be guided the way that you would have us to walk. Direct us now. Be with us this Sabbath and show us that which you would have us to do. We pray, Father, for your forgiveness. We pray for your blessing. We pray for your watch care. We ask your blessing on the message that is to be next given. Show us, Father, that which needs to change within us so that we may walk closer with you. For this we ask and this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.